you have a Bible, it's fine if you want, if you want to uh, look at it. We had someone in the, uh, in the house the other day, and uh, they, were, they were talking about how that God had taken them and just uh, told them to close the Bible and not to study it or not to read it and just to, just to get away from it, more or less. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, I can really appreciate that. And, uh, and, that, and that was, that's a hard thing for me to say because I've really built so much of my life off of what I would consider studying or trying to uh, do what Timothy says, to be a workman approved of God, rightly dividing the word of truth. And uh, that, that sometimes can be a real task to do that. And uh, I want to share something with you uh, about a thought or something God has kind of pricked me with and stirred me with for some time. And it has to do with something that the gentleman said about belief or about belief and uh, believing. And uh, I want you all to hear this and just try to hear it all the way through. But uh, six months ago or a year ago, I meet with a group of men. We kind of get together and just... We call it a Bible study, but it's really not a Bible study, so to speak. But uh, we discuss, we talk about the Bible some. <laughs> Occasionally we quote a scripture. But we have a great time. It's a tremendous fellowship. And uh, in that group of men, uh, six, eight months ago, a year ago, I, I just blurted something out that I had been chewing on and meditating on for probably a year or two or longer. And I just said, beliefs divide us. But what you know will always unite you. And that just grabbed one of the men in there. It just, he said, what? What did you say? I said, well, a belief system. And I said, we all have a belief system. I said, it doesn't matter if there's two people in a room or 200 or 2,000 or 200,000. I said, you can go around the room and you can ask them what you believe. And they begin to tell you, I believe, I believe, I believe. And you won't have to go around the room past two people and you'll find that they don't believe the same thing. <laughs> that they're divided. And, and many times people get irate or, or they get excited or they get, well, you mean you don't believe? You know, and then, or I, I can remember when uh, Connie and I were really, uh, our lives had been a wreck and uh, our, we're being torn apart and God was dealing with us and uh, we began to search for God in a deeper, meaningful way. And in that search, someone told us, says, well, we know what you're searching for. Is you find it down at that storefront church. And it, and it was, uh, and what they were referring to was the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Of course, if you're a real good Baptist boy, you believe you're baptized in the Holy Spirit and you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise without any evidence of speaking in tongues. And so I grew up as a Baptist kid sometime, and I thought, well, what does that mean? So it was another belief system that I had to add to my repertoire of belief systems. And, you know, as you, as you grow or you feel like you unfold or you, you begin to flower in the things of God, you begin to develop a, a humongous belief system. I believe. I believe. And the more I began to think about that and the more I began to dig into that, I began to realize that was my problem. It was all this garbage I believed. If I could ever get free from all of those beliefs because those beliefs had me in a box. I couldn't even be who God called me to be because I believed. And the more I began to look into that and the more I began to research that, I began to realize that that's not what God was trying to say. It hasn't been. And I realized that, that uh, the Nicene Council, and I say this a lot, the Nicene Council give us a system of beliefs that we all espouse and hold to dearly and many times don't know that we hold to that. And that was, the Nicene Council gave us the Nicene Creed. And if you've been introduced to Christianity, you believe a large part of the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed was, we believe, and then they begin to unfold their belief system to establish them. 
However, the early church and not the church that Jesus built because he didn't build one. <laughs> he didn't come to build one. It, it had nothing to do with his purpose. All he come to do is just to, to let people know that the relationship between him and the Father was the same relationship that everybody should have, and that relationship was not with a material God that looked like a man or that had the image of a man as the Jews had because the Jews had an image of a man God or in other words a God in the image of man rather than us being in the image of God we just kind of got it backwards religion always does that gets it backwards and begins to box us up box us in and then when you Realize that you are in your box, and it's hard to get out of your box. You can live your whole life, live and die and love God and be all these things, and still be in that box. And so I told these guys, I said, what you know, what intuitively is in you, is in everybody, it will always unite you. It will never, ever. See, it doesn't matter to me what anybody believes anymore. I, 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 I don't, I'm not bothered by that because... I realize so many people believe so many things. And me, myself, I have to deal with that that also. And, you know, I, I have been trying for several years to put a, a watch on my tongue to not tell people what I believe. Because I find out that most people, that, that, that we're all, we all have belly buttons, and my belief is not any different from your belief. And even though we may not believe the same thing, uh, I try not to tell people what I believe anymore. I try to tell people what I know. What I know. What I know. And when you, you go and look at what happened in the early church or with the Pauline epistles or the writings of Marcion or any of the, the men of God who were a part of the early church, who were a part of that formation of a body of people, whether they were meeting in, in uh, underground places or in hidden places or in barns or in homes or in synagogues, wherever they were meeting, they weren't trying to establish anything that anybody believed. All they were trying to do was build a relationship that's built out of knowing. Because you see, I know her. I know her. See, I know her. Because I have had a relationship with her for a long time. So I know things about, it ain't got nothing to do with what I believe. It has everything to do with what I know. Jesus said this in John chapter 8, you shall know, the Greek word gnoskos, you shall know the truth. We can pile truth up all kinds of ways and truth can just simply be your twist on a belief. And you call it truth. And, and that's what people do. They say, well, Man, we believe the truth. And I said, well, what is your truth? Well, our truth is, if you're going to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, then you have to have the evidence of speaking in tongues. Well, our belief is you talk in tongues, you're the devil. <laughs> and you call that truth. And before you know it, your truth divided you. And that's what's happened. So the whole body of Christ, you find it on every corner of every street of every city that there is. It's another church built on another belief system because they couldn't get along with the people down the road. So they split the thing and built another belief system. Well, we don't believe the same way they do. And we have this instrument today that's in the earth and we call it the church. When it's a tool of religion that's filled with condemnation, filled with judgment, filled with hate, it's filled with anything other than what Christ said. This is how you will know them by their love for one another. Not because of what they believe or what they don't believe, but by their love for one another. So, for a long time, I have been trying to pursue what I know. You know, things that I know, things that are intuitive, things that, that God has shared with me. And so, to know the truth is to be free. And I, I believe everybody really wants to be free. So, if you will bear with me or follow with me or just try to listen to me. I have one lady from up in, I believe it was up in Illinois or Wisconsin. She said, you really are from the South, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am, I sure am. <laughs> Born, bred, and raised right there at the foot of the mountains, you know. Won't call her green cornbread. I, and I can't help it. I've tried. I tried to. Uh, I tried to uh, beef up my speech and try to make it proper. 
and, and save you and I instead of you and me. And try to forget saying can't and ain't and just don't work. And so what I want to do is, uh, you know, and I, I have been to, I have been to uh, seminary and I've been to college and I have several doctor's degrees and several uh, PhDs. But they were all out there behind the woodshed. That's where I got every one of them. <laughs> Found them all back there. And uh, it comes from a lot of years of, of living. And I hate to say that because I stayed 39 for a long time. And uh, finally, my oldest daughter, uh, Connie and I's oldest daughter, turned 40. And she said, Daddy, you're just in denial. And I said, no, you're just a year older than me. <laughs> <laughs> so... I, I, yeah, this past year I went to 49, so I'm 49. And if you do have a Bible, and if you don't, it's no big deal. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. I like to use it because God shows me things from it that most people didn't know was in it. And so I like to use it for that purpose. And, uh, but, you know, don't be, don't be offended at me this morning. Just bear with me and love me if you can and, and let me just share with you things that God has said to me. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Now, Connie and I cut our teeth on what we call the charismatic movement or the faith movement, uh, which I guess some of you guys did that. But that's what we come into the things of God. And, and what caused me to get interested in that was the idea that God would actually bless me or, in other words, cause me to materially prosper. That was kind of a foreign idea to me from the religious community that I was in because I don't know where I got the idea, but somehow or another in the idea of the religious community I was in, I thought that probably the poorer you were, the more humble you would be and the more God would love you. And so rich people were in the mafia and God wasn't too interested in them. So... I just had that idea, and I didn't like that idea. <laughs> I really didn't. I like. I seem to have liked the finer things of life. Mother said, "Lynn, you have a champagne pocket. Uh, you have a champagne taste in a beer pocketbook." <laughs> and uh, so, well, maybe true. So this passage of scripture I want to share with you, and I want to talk about this scripture or look at this scripture and kind of use it like a hinge pin, because it says some things that I would like for us to see. In a different light, or from a different twist. Uh, this is something I wrote here a few days ago, just out of prayer and meditation. It says, we have in America one of the richest nations on the earth in material wealth, and one of the poorest nations on the earth in spiritual wealth. We have a famine of knowing, as in you shall know the truth, and you shall be free. We've been taught dogma. We've been taught doctrine, and we've been taught beliefs. In other words, we have many, many beliefs and very, very few knowings. A knowing is something God said to you. And I want you to hear that. I'll say that quite a few times. A knowing is something God said to you. Many people say, well, God didn't say anything to me. Then you don't know anything. <laughs> You may memorize a lot of scripture. Hey, they, a lot of people can memorize scripture. Hey, a lot of people can quote what you call Bible verses. That doesn't mean nothing. That doesn't do any good. I can remember years ago they, they accused Madame Merle Hare for getting a prayer out of school, and yet she could quote you half the Bible. She knew the Bible. Wasn't no big deal. She was a lawyer. She understood and read and could read scripture. She had refrigerator verses. That's no big deal. How many of you ever found when you come through the if you came through the charismatic movement like I did, you had all your favorite refrigerator scriptures? It didn't do you a bit of good. Yeah. Oh my God can supply all my needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We could quote that and be broke, and most people that I knew were didn't have a penny in their pocket. You could ask them to loan you five dollars. I'm sorry, I'm broke. <laughs> oh but my God will supply all my needs according to His riches and glory. It's, what you know is what God says to you. What you know is what God told you. God told you something, you heard it, now you know what God said. 
If you think you know what God said because you read the Bible through in one year, all you, all you did was read a book of history in most cases, or you read a book that men down through the last hundreds of years have tampered with and gave you their twist on what he was saying. <laughs> and sad truth is, that's what's happened to most of us. We believe some twist, some man, whether it's Irenaeus or Ignatius or, or some of the other Constantine or Augustine or R, 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 and they give you their twist of it or their version of it, and you say, oh, wow, that's what it says. Paul said there's neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Then Paul over here, confused in Timothy, says, you women keep silent, shut up. You ain't got no right to speak out. Just go home and clean the house and wash dishes. <laughs> and, you know, you kind of scratch your head and say, well, Paul, uh, I mean, are you confused? Are there no difference? Are they equality? Are they the same, man and women? Do we have the right? Can a woman preach and a man has, uh, can a man preach or do, are they got to be quiet or whatever? And, you know, if you get to study and you find out those pseudo scriptures, those false passage scriptures, that Paul didn't even write them at all. But we got them in there and we water them and we worship them and say, oh, God said. What did God say? Or is God confused? Does God know? And the answer is yes, God does know. God's not confused. I think we are. You know, you know it's like someone says, well, I, there's an enemy among us. And I looked in the mirror and it was me. Yeah. And it's sometimes it's hard for us to recognize that. So when God told you something or you heard God say something, then you know. You know. That's something that doesn't leave you. That's something that'll say, that's something you can take to the bank. <laughs> you can actually believe that. <laughs> you heard his word. Now, you don't have to believe something someone told you. Here in America, we have so-called churches on every other corner, yet we have poverty, we have fighting, we have sicknesses, we have all kinds of problems, not only in our cities and our communities and our streets. We have these same problems even multiplied in these instruments we call churches. Something's wrong with that. In America, we have all this wealth and all this riches, yet we, and we rank five in the world as one of the richest nations in the world. Yet we rank 26th in the world as far as being happy is concerned. Did y'all realize that? Yeah. They, did a, they did a study about nations to see which nations were happy. And America fell, the, one of the richest, top five richest nations in the world, fell to number 26 as far as being happy. And some of the nations in the world that rank in the highest were actually some of the poorest in material gain. You know, I've seen a lot of people who were extremely happy didn't have a lot of stuff. Right. You understand what I'm talking about? Stuff, you know, the stuff that, the things that we're always saying. I hear people saying, well, I've got to, to work to work I go because I owe. You know? <laughs> Not happy. Don't know what happy is. I don't know anybody that doesn't want to be happy. I don't know anybody that's not looking for happy or looking for abundance or looking for blessing. We just look for it in so many of the wrong places. Have you ever noticed that? Happiness is inside you. It's not outside you. If you think you can find happiness in meth or in drugs, and I did for a year, for years, I, I thought I was really having a good time. I realized the next day it was kind of rough. <laughs> You know, and my wife got to where she wouldn't even go with me to parties because she said I was uh, disrespectful. Or, well, I just because I wanted to dance with everybody's wife that was there or who, anybody. It didn't matter to me. You know, and they follow them home. It didn't matter. She didn't want to go with me no more because I thought that was happy. I know the next day it wasn't, it wasn't too good. But, you know, I really didn't find happy until I found really God, and I didn't find him out yonder somewhere, I really found him in me. When I just really started connecting to that that was already there, that that God placed there, that's it's always been. So we look for happy in the wrong places, we look for it outside of us when it's always within us. See, we look for abundance out there in things when it's inside us. See, God's in us, and we, we somehow or another have lost that connection. You know what I'm saying? Religion has taught us to believe a lot of things, but it hadn't taught us to know many things. 
just hadn't taught us to make that connection. So if you have this, so I only have two hours. Is this right? Two hours. <laughs> if, uh, verse six, Hebrews eleven six. But it says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Well, here we have a word, faith. The word faith in the Greek is the word pistis, which actually means persuasion or assurance. It comes from the root Greek word patho, which means, now once you get trust or yield. So if you get to the root of the word faith, it means trust. Trust. Now, most of you in the natural don't really trust somebody that you don't know. Hello? No. The, now, you might say, well, yeah. Uh, well, there are not a lot of gullible people who will just accept somebody's word without knowing them. Now, I realize there are some, but usually when you trust someone, you trust someone, you know why? Because you build a relationship with them. You know, the Scripture uses this word know and knew in different ways, but it generally comes out of the concept of the idea where there's relationship. Like, for instance, Adam knew Eve and a child come forth. He began to produce things. Knew her. You see, that come out of a relationship. That come out of an intimate time. How can we... We're taught belief system from a church, but how can we know God unless we cultivate a relationship with God? Now, we've cultivated relationships with things that we call God. In other words, our church, our beliefs all of those religious things that we cultivate and build a relationship with those. And from those ideas or concepts, we have de developed or produced what we see in the earth today as the church or the vehicle that's known as the church, which is a very divided, divisive, angry, mean, <laughs> you know, and all the other things that you may add to that. But when you get to a, a real... A real understanding of faith, what you get to is you're going to get to a place where you come to trust God. In other words, you heard, you didn't read what God said. If you, all you have is what you read what God said, a refrigerator verse, and that's all you have. You don't have a relationship. You don't have a knowing. You don't trust Him. And I find that so many people acknowledge God, but don't trust God. Bottom line. If God said it, that's it. You can go to the bank on it. I mean, isn't that the bottom line? If God said it, you can go to the bank on it. Well, our problem is, did God say it to me? And there is where the rubber meets the road. You have to get to a place where God said to you. you in other words, you heard God say, I will meet your needs according to my riches. Well, hallelujah. I, you know what? I, I'm home free, folks. Because I will guarantee you God will not tell me something and leave me hanging. And God's not going to say something to me and then put me on the short end of the stick. It don't happen that way. Because I can go to the bank on what God said. Now, I'm not talking about a book that we got compiled of, of, of many, many years and we call that God's Word. That, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I realize that we say this thing that we call Holy Scripture or this is the Word of God. This contains some of the things God said, but this ain't the Word of God. Now, I know us, uh-oh, he's in trouble now. This does contain things God said, and men have manipulated, they've twisted it, they give you their versions of it. You know, in our area, we have churches on the corner, some of them that have, uh, have spent thousands of dollars building these big fancy signs that says, KJV only. Oh yeah, that's right, authorized, I'm sorry. Authorized KJV only. And if you, I, you know, I say ignorance gone to seed. I'm not going to that. In Wilson County, about an hour from here, if you go up along the Blue Ridge Parkway, you miles, you come around the dirt road, and you'll see a big old sign that says, Old King James Baptist Church. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, there I, I proved my point. Ignorance gone to seed. You know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not an educated man, but I'm not an ignorant person. I, I can look up a, a word in a dictionary. 
I can do some research in history. I may have failed it in school, but I can still research history. And, you know, so I'm telling you, this is not God's Word. This does contain some things God said, okay? And I know people get offended. I don't mean to be offensive in any way. I, I, this contains things God. I love this book. I've spent years in study and research in this book. I do love it. I really, I don't sleep with it though. <laughs> but I do her. <laughs> I know her. See? But I know the man that's supposedly the author of this book. That makes the difference. And we have this, we have this thing going on and he speaks to me and I hear what he says and that's his word. That's God's word. See, I, I want to read some of the things that God said to me. Some of these things that I'm reading to you are things God says to me. He does this to me when I'm in my meditation or when I'm in my moment of trying to connect or I'm saying, I'm just enjoying Him, you know. I'm just, I feel the breeze of His breath as it blows across my body. <laughs> and I say, hallelujah, there you are, Father, thank you. <laughs> so without faith, without this trust, without yielding to this, he says, it's, I can't please him. I can't, I can't be pleasing to him without that. And then they come and they said, for he that comes must believe that he is. And that word believe comes from the root Greek word, which is pistua, which actually means to entrust. It does not mean to build dogma and doctrine and belief systems. Okay? It just simply means to trust. And here's another word. I thought this was really cute about the word. It means to have credit. <laughs> Any of y'all got some of that? You got a pocket full of credit? Most people got a pocket, got more credit than they want. It means to have credit with God. You understand what credit is? If you go to the bank and you're going to borrow money to build a $500,000 home, then the bank kind of looks at everything and says, well, we're going to entrust you with this loan and we're going to credit you and we just we just believe or we entrust that you're going to pay it back well that's exactly what you have with God you have this trust you know what God says I trust you that's what that's what your father says I trust you and I'll give you the credit hallelujah and see, when God trusts you and God gives you the credit, now you've got something. <laughs> you've got something that you can, you can really go to the bank with. Have you ever made an agreement with your enemy and, who, and plotted to destroy yourself? I, I know that sounds like, that sounds bizarre. That sounds like, well, that, who would do something like that? Well, just look in the mirror and you'll see who would do something that's that bizarre, that silly. Would make an agreement with the enemy? And plot to destroy yourself? Yeah, we do that. We all do that unknowingly. You remember Jesus said this. He said, if any two of you on earth agree as touching anything, well, if you look at your circumstance in life, your circumstance in life is the result of your agreement with that circumstance, and that's why that circumstance materialized. Most people have made an agreement with the pain or the anger or the disappointment or the poverty or the sickness or, or, or whatever their dilemma is. They've made an agreement with it, and it has no alternative but to reproduce itself in your life and continues to do so. And we scratch our heads, I wonder what's wrong, God. Why can't you do something? And God says, well... I'm doing everything that you've asked me to do. You keep agreeing with your dilemma, and I don't have any alternative but to keep reproducing it for you. And I think it would be great if we could make a new agreement with life. Make the same agreement with it that God made with it. That's what the word confession means. You know, we think confession means that I've got to tell God all my dirty laundry as if he didn't know. Yeah, you think you li you lied or you stole or you did this or you 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 I won't say that. Yep, yeah. yeah. and got away with it because God wasn't there. There's not anywhere God's not. Where can you go where God's not? What can you do when God's not present? I don't think there's anything that that we could. Yet we somehow or another convinced ourselves that we did these things and got away. No, we make agreement with all of these issues in life. And then they just reproduce. They just keep cropping up. So you made an agreement with your enemy and you plotted to destroy yourself unknowingly. Most of us do that. Yet, yes, most of us have without knowing or planning what we have done. 
and we continue to ignore the signs in our life and thereby reap havoc, pain, disappointment, displeasure, disease, all the other diseases that go along with that. I mean, you know, can you, we, we continue to ignore the signs. Now, now I, oh God, give us an ear to hear and give us love for one another. <laughs> uh, my wife has a niece, a, a young girl, she's in her 30s, and, uh, how many of you understand that sugar diabetes is a controllable disease? Some of you may have it. It's something that actually medicine has proven through proper diet and through the right eating habits, you can literally control it. It don't have to destroy you. In other words, you don't have to have your legs cut off. And yet, my niece, we tried to share this with her, said, if you just would eat right, through the right eating God would bring healing, and you don't have to cut your legs off. And you know what she said? I ain't going to do that. I'm going to make an agreement with this stuff and keep eating it. And then I'll take medicine. I mean, is this good or what? Am I doing the wrong thing here? <laughs> uh, we can, see, we continue to ignore the signs. If you, if you drove your car like we live our life, we would, we probably wouldn't get home. We'd all be killed. If you ignored the stop sign, you ignored the traffic light, and you just run right on through it and say, well, I can do it. I can get away with it this time. Kaboom! Somebody gonna come through and kill you. Well, we do that. You see, there's signs all the time. God just got all these signs up in front. We just totally ignore them, and boom, we just go right on through them, thinking we're invulnerable. Well, I mean, what do we do? You know, we say, oh, it's too hard. It's, you know, the only reason it's too hard is because you made an agreement with it being too hard. Why don't you say, I can do it? I can do it. You know, greater is He that's in me. Then he that's out there. I can do this thing. Oh, we'd like to say something up there and I do. I can do it. You can do it. God ordains you to be able to do it. You are created in his image and his likeness, so you can do it. The only reason we can't do it, we don't do it, because we ignore the signs that are there in front of us all the time. God's not asking us to do something hard or difficult. The true answer is that you can do it, but here is another flip side of that, is the true answer is that you need to just get saved. And, and there again, if you put that in the box of your belief system, you don't know what I said. You don't have a clue what I just said. But you understand, the word save in the Greek is the word sozo. Salvation is the word santerio. And I want to give you a real simple North Georgia Understanding of that word, it just means to connect your source. It just means to be one. It just means to be whole. It don't mean nothing about praying a prayer. It don't mean telling God your dirty laundry that He already knows. See? It don't mean join the church. It don't mean go in the baptismal pool. It don't mean any of those things to be saved or to get saved. It simply means to connect back to your source. To become one. To be whole again. Why? Because you're divided. Because we are a divided house, Jesus said, you can't stand. This is the house of God. Not a building, not something on the corner. This is the tabernacle that God lives in. This is the house that gets divided and winds up in chaos. And when this house becomes united, connected back to its source, then you're saved. You didn't join the church. You didn't fly away. You didn't even go nowhere. You just connected back. You just got back to from where you came. Hallelujah. And, and so, so when I when I'm talking about, I said, yeah, the answer, the answer to the dilemma of my niece who has sugar diabetes so bad that it threatens her life. The answer for her is to get saved. But she would hear it and she'd say, well, I gotta go join the church. I gotta pray their prayer. I gotta do this. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. No, those are belief systems. You don't have to do anything other than just trust God. Just connect. Just get back to that place. 
That's what, that is the answer. That's, it's so simple. Oh, but we have so complicated it. The true answer is to get saved, but it doesn't mean what we think it means, nor does it mean what religion taught us that it means. It does mean to learn. It does not mean to learn a lot of beliefs. It doesn't mean that your eye, it doesn't mean that you have to agree with this or that. Now, I wrote this little note. Your idea or your concept of God will determine your relationship with God. Did you hear that? Your idea or your concept of God will deter- it will limit your relationship with God. You see, we, we have been given this idea about God from religion that God is a judge. And... Now listen, we've been given this idea that God is a judge and that God sits there to judge you and you better watch it because He's watching every move that you make and He's judging you and He's going to judge you. Well, that's not true. That's a lie because God is pure energy. Energy is light. And out of light, which is God, which is energy, out of that, proceeds love and life, not judgment and condemnation. Jesus said this. He said, I didn't come to judge the world. That's what he said. John chapter 3. He said, I didn't come to judge you. Jesus said in, in Matthew, he said, don't judge that or don't judge, because the way you judge it, you measure it out, that's how it gets back to you. God help us. But yet we see God, we make God this this old gray-headed man sitting up yonder somewhere in this ethereal heaven and sitting on this great big rich throne. He's got all the riches and all the wealth. And he's sitting there and he's judging you, condemning you. And that's not true. God loves you. The God that is energy is, is not a judge, but is love. God is love. If you will look closely with me at the idea and the concept that God is a judge, you will see that that idea will produce God into becoming a tyrant, a brute, no different than Saddam Hussein, no different than Hitler. I always, it kind of bothered me, I couldn't figure out how God could give me free will yet beat the hell out of me for using it. <laughs> now, I, I thought when I, now I thought when I wait just a minute, God, you said that you give me a free will to make a choice, and I can go do this or I can do, go do that. Yet you're going to condemn me, you're going to judge me to a burning hell because I make a choice that you don't like. That's dictatorship. There's no love in that. There's no mercy and compassion and forgiveness. You see, love and mercy and compassion and the, the nature that God is, is God loses nothing. There's not anything you can do anywhere you can go that God won't be there and God won't be with you and draw you back all of the time. Now, I don't have a clue how many lives you have to live for you to get back. <laughs> but i tell you this, God don't lose. And God don't lose any. God loses none. God loses nothing. Religion is our greatest enemy. And it wants to appear as though it was doing God's business. Have you noticed that? It wants you and me to think that it's helping God out. And all the time, what it does is it leads you and me further away from God. You know, and all I would say to that, that is just simply look at this instrument that we have called the church and just tell me. I, I'm not talking about judging it. I'm talking about just simply discerning it. Just look. Just open your eyes to see what's happened, where we are, what, what's going on. Because this instrument that we call the house of God or the place where God's love is supposed to dwell is an instrument that if you're in trouble, you better not go down there. <laughs> you know, they ain't going to get you. I, I mean, I know. Uh, uh, you know, I, I used to have barroom buddies. And, it, you know, they might, not, they might not, not agree with you, but we can settle that outside that door in just a minute, and, and then we'll come back in we're buddies again. But you don't do that in the church. Son, you, you mess up there. You, you not only 
you go out and fight, so they're going to continually stab you in your back yeah. from now on. Yeah. That isn't God. That's not God. That's a, that's a system built on beliefs. We believe this and we believe that. But what God meant for us to believe was to for us to trust Him. For us to just come to a place where we trust God. Now, if you will, go with me to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. It's, it says, And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no cry, no crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. Everybody say pain. 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 I have been for quite a number of years trying to correct a wrong and an error that's been given to the church for hundreds of years about sin. Most everybody in the church thinks sin is cussing, drinking, messing around with women, and all those other things. Most people in church do that. Don't they? Don't they? I mean, I'm not, I'm not passing any judgment. Most people in church do that. See, most people in the religious organizations, that's what they do. And yet, that's not what sin is. See, that has nothing to do with what sin is. Paul says, if you will walk in the Spirit, you will not fill up the lusts of the flesh, which are. And he begins to list these things that are flesh. It don't matter if you have what you call saved flesh or unsaved flesh. You always have a tendency to get angry, to get in strife, to get in division, to look at a pretty woman, to get drunk, or to die, to die, to die. That's the works of the flesh. It's not sin. It has nothing to do with sin. In the book of Romans, the word sin is used about 44 times. One time, one time out of those 44 times is the Greek word harmatia. 43 times is the Greek word harmatado. And those two words, even though sounding a whole lot alike, don't even mean anywhere near the same thing. Harmatia means to miss the mark. It's found one time to miss the mark. It's, a, it's an archery term. Nobody gets in trouble if they do it. <laughs> Now, if, you have, if you've got a 10-year-old kid and you're teaching him how to shoot a bow and arrow at a target and he can't hit the target, are you going to send him to hell and burn him forever and ever because the little rascal just can't hit it? Huh? Well, that's pretty stupid, I think. No, that, that's, to me, that's an unresponsible parent. To me, that's a parent that really doesn't love his child because you're going to send him to hell because he can't hit your target? One time in the book of Romans... Harmatia, missed the mark. Forty-three times is harm. I mean, harmatano. Forty-three times is harmatia, which doesn't mean what we bought. It means to have offense. It means to be angry, and it means to have pain. Because most anybody who has offense or anger usually has pain inside their heart, and you touch that painful place, boom, they'll respond on you and don't even mean to. I know, my wife and I, for years, I mean, for years we were married. She was so mad. <laughs> I thought you mad at me. <laughs> she wasn't mad at me. She, she carried pain in her heart. It drove our marriage apart. We couldn't love each other because of the pain. I see so many people in their marriages trying to put on a facade and trying to look like there's something, yet there's pain in their heart. That's sin. I say, it's harmless. Yeah, that's what, and God says, I just want to touch that. Because if you won't let me touch that, you'll keep it. You can carry it all the days of your life. But if you'll ever let me touch it, I can remove it. Whoo, doggy, you're talking about somebody different now. That's who I'm married to. Someone who got delivered from sin. Someone who didn't wait to go to glory in the sweet by and by to get free from the pain. Someone who opened the heart up and God just out of His love and compassion just reached her. Oh, God, He put her arms around and just loved her, pulled her down. Oh, I can fix that. 
And when you and I, I said it right, sir. When we as the church, the instrument of this love, will quit judging people and see the people in the earth that carry this pain inside them, you won't be mad at them. I don't care if they're addicted on meth, Rob Stoke kill. It don't matter. You'll, you'll do just exactly like Jesus did when he hung up there. He said, Father, don't be mad at them. Forgive them. They, they don't know what they're doing. Why? They're doing it out of the pain. Sin. That's what sin is. See, sin's not going out and get drunk. I told people at the church, I said, you know, Ella J is just a, a few, 30 miles or so over in the mountains. And it's an apple growing country. They grow apples there. And I said, you go over there this year. Pick every apple off the tree that you want to. But you know what? <laughs> Next year they're coming back. That's what we have going on in this instrument called church. They come to the front aisle and they tell God everything in the flesh they've done. And next year they're doing the same thing again. It comes right back. And they call that getting saved? Uh Uh-uh. No, what we need in the church right now is a revolution of getting saved. That's exactly what we need. We need a revolution of getting connected back. We need a revolution of sozo being made whole. Being connected back to my source. Getting back into the place where I'm in fellowship. I'm in relationship. I'm having quite a deal with God. And oh, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Getting back in that place where God wants us to be. We read these passages like here in the book of Revelations. And we say, oh, hallelujah, that's how it will be when I get to heaven. No, that's how it will be when heaven gets to be in you. And I'm going to tell you something. You don't have to wait to go anywhere for that to happen. That's already happened. That's a done deal. Right now is the best time. Right now is, is a moment that never existed that God created for you and I. And here we are. Hallelujah. What are you going to do with it? It never was here before, and here it is right now. That's heaven. No pain. No pain. Just, just say, okay, Father, here I am. Now I want you to notice he says this. Verse 4, God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death nor, nor sorrow. And I, you know, I can develop into all of these words, but I don't have time because I'm limited to two hours. And, and there will be, there will, there will be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. The word former things passed away. The word passed away in the Greek means pardoned. Pardoned. Did you hear that? Lots of people need to know that. Your pardon, hello, your pardon, there's nobody judging you. The Father is not judging you. You may be, the church or the religious organization may be, but God is. God's loving you. Verse 5, and he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I will make all things new. And that's exactly what he did. And that's exactly what he does. Is he doesn't make new things. See, God didn't give me a new Connie, but God gave me a new Connie. <laughs> he that hath an ear to hear. Yeah, you know, and I'm gonna tell you what. <laughs> the one he gave me is the one that I fell in love with when I was a teenager and she walked in my classroom when I was in eleventh grade and I said, That's mine. <laughs> That belongs to me, y'all. That's mine. Hallelujah. I make all things new. And he said unto me, write these things. These words are true. These words are faithful. Verse 6, and he said unto me, it's done. I'm the the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. That's what you're drinking right now. You may not see it. But there's a river that's in this place. There's a fountain that's flowing. Hallelujah. Yeah. There, there is something in here that will quench the thirst that you really thirst with. And that's the one in your soul. That's that hunger that's inside you. That's that place inside you with that river of, of God's life that grows all manner of fruit that heals you. It's not something to go to. It's something to be in. Yeah. You and I are in that. Verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son, etc., etc., etc. And God is just trying to get you and me to see this and to understand that he knows 
who we are. He knows where we are. And he loves us in spite of us. Period. The bottom line. Jesus said this. And if you want to, I meant to tell you to hold your place in Hebrews. But if you would, real quickly, turn over to the book of John. I want to show you something. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. See, now I know some of you wish you brought your Bible. You didn't know this was in here. <laughs> uh, we pass them out at church. I said, here, y'all, we pass it because you're going to see something that you didn't know was in here. I promise you. You're going to you're gonna think, well, you think you know that? Nah. You, we'll show you something. Religion has done us damage with this book. I'm telling you, they have. Uh, you know, they had, they had nothing. They had nothing. No new age. No outer age. No inner age. Not any age got anything on this book. If you understand. If you can see it. If you can get to that place where God can just really show you how much He loves you and what God wants to do for you and I. Where did I say? John chapter 5, just a verse. I just want you to see this verse. And I, I realize that many people, they have this idea that they, that they have a hard time getting past. Jesus did it and I can't. I mean, Jesus walked on water and I can't. Jesus multiplied fishes and loaves, and I can't. Jesus healed blind eyes, and I can't. Jesus raised dead girls, and I can't. Jesus walked through the midst of those crowds that were angry at him, and I can't. You know what my grandpa used to say? He, he was God's big brother, and grandpa would say, Boy, you better not ever tell me you can't do anything. <laughs> I mean, can't was like cussing to my grandpa. You didn't say I can't. I mean, just, just was not, it was not a part of the English language. As far as my grandpa was concerned, you do not tell me you can't. And uh, so I learned early on not to say can't. I learned to say I can. I will. My seven-year-old grandpa said, you get in that truck and you drive that load of hay to the barn. Grandpa, I can't reach the paddles. Boy, don't you tell me you can't reach the paddles. Sit on the edge of the seat. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> Look at, look at John 5. This is the verse that's always been here. Most people just didn't know it, but it was here. Verse 30. John 5, 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. In other words, Jesus said, of my flesh, I can't walk on water. Of my flesh, I can't heal sick. Of my flesh, I can't multiply bread. Of my flesh, uh, of mine own self. You know what he's talking He said, I, ego, can do nothing. Do you think that you're different from him? You're not any different. You, but you know what he said? He said, I do nothing unless I see my father do it. I say nothing unless I hear my father say it. What is Jesus trying to get you and me to see? He's trying to say, you've got to have a relationship. You've got to cultivate this relationship so you can see what the Father's doing and you can hear what the Father's saying. What do you think Paul was talking about in Ephesians when he said, Father, I pray that you would open the eyes of their understanding where they can see. Well, we're blind, leading the blind. And that's why we're all in the ditch. And God's just simply trying to get us to come to that place where we open the eyes of our understanding. You give them two eyes because there are two eyes to see with. One of them's natural and one of them's spiritual. One does not exemplify the other. They complement each other. God wanted them married together to be one. You've got two ears so you can hear the natural and you can hear the spirit. God wants them merged together so they be one. God wants you and I world walking in the earth the same way we walk in heaven. Yeah, not any different. Hallelujah. You know, God, you know, we got so much. We said, well, Jesus, I can't do anything by myself. So he said the same thing you and I would say. He says the same well, I can't, I can't do I can't, I can't. But she said, but I can do what the Father shows me. And I can say what I hear the Father say. Hallelujah. What he's just saying for, for himself is the same thing that we should be saying of ourselves. We become addicted to the natural or the carnal or the egoic way of life and we get stuck there. That's, what, that's where pain begins to grow, is you're stuck. And we think God's mad because I'm stuck. You know, it's like a car that's stuck in the ditch. It has a 10,000 pound winch on board and a 100 foot of cable. And all he's sitting there saying, I wish somebody would come pull me out. 
And that's exactly where we are in the church. We said, I wish somebody would come for me. I wish somebody would come lift this off me. I wish somebody. And you know what God said? I'm the winch inside you, dummy. Hook to the tree and I'll pull you out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I'm, you know, it's not something that I've got to go at you under somewhere and find. It's inside me. It's right inside here. God's given it to me as a gift from Him. It's His presence. It's who He is. It's like you remember, you remember, some of you remember, I guess all y'all remember, but her, she's not old enough to remember. And him, he's not old enough to remember. But all the rest of y'all remember when you put one of them old, big old albums on the, on the turntable and it goes to singing a good song and all of a sudden, up, it starts all over again. Y'all remember that? And then what did you do? Then I would go and I'd get a nickel and put it on the top of the needle and then it would just slide right on through that spot in the record, that strap. That's exactly the way our life is, you see. When we get stuck in those places, and here we go around the mountain again. Did y'all know that's what eternal damnation is? In Mark, where it talks about you will have eternal damnation, eternal comes from the Greek word aonos, damnation comes from the Greek word krisis, and what Jesus is saying is you will have a continual crisis in your life. Most people will, from continued crisis to the continued crisis. Just that big scratch in the record of life. Say, uh oh, here we go again, back around the same problem, same that same situation. When God said, Just let my glory I'm changed from glory. You know another word for glory is weight. Weight. It's like putting a nickel on the needle. Just a little glory. A little of God's weight. Oh, <laughs> I get round through this. A little of God's presence. That's all we need. Just God's presence to just get me on around this situation, Father. Uh, find that little book. It's hard to find. Habakkuk. Just go to Matthew. Turn backwards about four books and I believe you'll find it. Habakkuk. Yep, you got you got Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai, Zephaniah, and I believe right there will be Habakkuk, just next door. Probably one of the most famous passages of scripture in the Bible. It's in here about three or four times. And we started out using it. It's impossible to please God without faith. I remember I used to think faith was a muscle. I was kind of taught faith was a muscle. And the way I exercise my muscle of faith is I memorize more Scripture. And so the more of the Scripture, boy, I can memorize, I am a man of faith. (laughs) I can quote more Bible than you can. (laughs) I'm stronger than you are. I got more faith than you got. (laughs) Oh, dear God, that didn't work, did it? (laughs) We got tired of lifting weights. It ain't working. (laughs) Couldn't get around this faith issue, though. The word Habakkuk. I've got got to leave you on another wild goose chase. But the word Habakkuk, if you look up the definition of the word, if you look up the meaning of the word, it means a wrestler. Or one who wrestles. Isn't that us? Isn't that who we are? How many of y'all are wrestling to lose five more pounds? I mean, that's usually a good one right there. I usually pick on that one. I just about got 90% of it because we in America need to lose five more pounds. Hello, boy. That just kind of ricocheted around in here, didn't it? Ching, 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 ching. Let's move on. We'll talk about something else. But we're all wrestling over something, aren't we? We're wrestling over some kind of a... That seems to be the nature of us. We're just wrestling. We're, we're doing that. Well, that's what Habakkuk means. Habakkuk means to wrestle. Hold your finger right here in Habakkuk chapter 2. And just quickly, go back over to Genesis, I believe, chapter 20, uh, 32, I think. Let me look. Yes, here we go. Genesis chapter 32. Hallelujah. Now, you all know this story, but I just wanted you to read it and look at it with me. It says in verse 34, Jacob was left alone and there wrestled. Y'all remember that? 
That's a dumb thing to do, ain't it? Wrestle with God? I mean, y'all think about this. Now think about it. Come on, you get it. That's how we have been told this. That's the image. That's the picture we've been told that he's wrestling with God or he's wrestling with this angel, whichever you'd like to say. But I, I sit and I think about that. Now, why in the world am I going to come up against this dude and this guy that I'm going to wrestle with him? I'm going to get hurt. And I know I'm going to get hurt before I even get started. It is, the word here for wrestle actually doesn't mean to have hand-to-hand combat right. or to see who's stronger than the other one. The word here is a kind of an unusual word. It's abach. And it means particles of light mingled together. <laughs> Abach. Did you get that? Part, did you see God is light? That's what energy is. And do you know what? You a chip off the old block. So that means you're light. Jesus said, don't you know that you're a light, a city, to be set on the hill? And what happens when you as light, even though yours may not be as bright as his, mingles with his? You want me to tell you what happens? You walk different. You come out of that with a different walk. And not only will you come out of it with a different walk, you come out of it with a new name. You'll no longer be a deceiver or filled with trickery. Now you'll be one of God's blessings, a prince. Now that's what this passage of Scripture says. This don't say it that good in North Georgia. Especially if it's King James. Because most people, King James, don't know what that says. And it says, if you look at verse 30, and Jacob called the name of that place Denel, Denial, or whatever that means. And why? He said, because I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And you know what that word preserved means? It means my life is recovered. You know how that happens? Out of knowing. Allow God to be. Intimacy. Just get in that place where you and God, you can know truth. Not memorize a book. But you can know. That's what wrestling's about. Now, over here with Habakkuk, now I want you to see this, and I want to read this, because I'm, I'm trying to find a place to land this and close them. And I haven't been able to find one yet. But if you'll follow me here real quickly in Habakkuk. Is everybody too hot? Is it getting too hot? Is it okay? Y'all give me give me about ten more minutes or so. Habakkuk chapter 2. And, and y'all follow me with this real quickly. He says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. And I will watch to see what he will say unto me. And what I will answer when I am reproved. And, and what, uh, what Habakkuk is saying right here, he's kind of, he's, uh, he's wrestling with God or whatever. He's, the light particles are beginning to transform. And he said, I've got to get up here in this place. And while I'm up here in this place, I have got to come to where I can see what God says. Now, listen to it in this translation. He said, I know I have been rash to talk out plainly this way to God. I will, in my thinking, stand upon my post of observation and station myself on the tower of the fortress, and I will watch to see what God will say within me. Not unto me, within me. See, the problem of separation The problem of division is we're always looking for something outside of us. It's not out there. It's inside you. It's within you. It's inside you. And and this is what he's saying. He said, I'm going to station myself so I can see, I can hear what's said within me so I can answer. Now, I asked Gary if I had the living. The living Bible says it's really good. Actually, the living Bible, which is just a paraphrase, is more accurate to the Hebrew than the King James. But he goes on and he says in verse 2, it says, And the Lord answered and he said, Write the vision. Everybody say vision. 
Now, you understand what the vision is. Now, I want you to get this. It's just, this it slips right past you if you don't stop. And I, every time I do that, I think of that little thing. Stop in the name of love before you pray. And my wife says, don't do that. See, God wants you and me to stop because you're running through all the signs. They're right in front of you and you just keep running through them. You have signs that God said, stop, think about this. Just become aware of it. God's not trying to get you to do something about it. God's not trying to make you do this. God just says, stop and be aware of it. Look at it. And in your observation of it, and you're being aware, and you're seeing, and God says, I'll take care of that. I'll touch that pain. I heal that. Oh, hallelujah. Verse 2, it said, And the Lord answered, and He said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tablets. Now, what's He saying? He said, I want you to write the vision. I want you to write the dream. I want you to write what I said. I want you to just take time. Because, you see, when God says something to you, when God speaks to you, you see it in vision. You see it in a form. You know, God said car, and you saw a Lincoln, or a Mercedes. You see? See, you see, see, God says, when God speaks, you see something. You see it. That's the vision. That's, that's what he's talking about. He said, I want you to write the vision and make it plain, make the vision plain, that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it, it will speak. It, it, everybody say it. It's the vision. Say that. Say it's the vision. It'll not lie. Though it tarry. In other words, it didn't, it did, did. maybe God said, I'll do this. That's the vision. Okay. It, it may not at this moment materialize. It may. It may. It's no big deal. Just know this. Just, you can go to the bank on it. Bless God. It's coming. <laughs> you can count on this fact. God said it. It's going to happen. That's all he's saying. He said, write the vision. It may tarry. It may not. It don't matter. Though it tarry, uh, wait on it. He said, he said, because it, everybody say it, it's the vision. It's what he said. It'll surely come. Now, you know what? Then he said, behold, verse, verse four, behold, his soul which is lifted up in him is not, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. But the just shall live by faith. Well, what is faith? Faith is God speaking to you. It's God's Word to you. And when you hear God's Word spoken to you, you have a vision and you know that it will surely come. That's what faith is. You see, when you read in Hebrews chapter 11 about the heroes of faith, what you read about are people who heard what God said and then they just did it. It doesn't matter whether it was Noah it doesn't matter if it was Moses. It doesn't matter if it's Rahab a harlot. It doesn't matter if it's Pharaoh. It doesn't matter when God says it, it'll happen. But you've got to get yourself in a place or on a watchtower or in a place of communion or in a place of intimacy where you hear what God said and then you can do it. Because that's what faith is. Now the sad thing is, and I'm going to show you something right here closing. In Hebrews, back over to Hebrews where we come, we started. Hebrews chapter 11 is this passage of Scripture is misquoted in every translation that I have ever seen. Whether it's the King James, the New American Standard, the New International Version, the Amplified, every translation I've ever seen misquotes Habakkuk what he said in the Hebrews chapter 10, the last few verses, which lays the foundation for Hebrews chapter 11, and I want you to look at it with me. Verse uh, chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has a great recompense of reward, for you have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Now here, verse 37, is a quote, misquote, from Habakkuk, chapter 2. Notice what it says. For yet a little while, and he, they insert he, a personal pronoun, 
And most people, just like my Bible, it's an annotated note reference Bible, it has a little note out the side of this referring to this he is Jesus. And though he ain't here yet, wait on him. You can carry him, wait on him, because one day he's going to come. That's not at all what Habakkuk was talking about. Habakkuk wasn't talking about Jesus. Habakkuk wasn't talking about a he. Habakkuk was talking about what God said. In other words, the vision. Though the vision, though what God said didn't materialize at that moment, wait on it. It's coming. It's coming. Now watch what he says, verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. That's not what Habakkuk said. Habakkuk said that after you've done the will of God, you have need of patience because whatever God says is going to happen. Amen. Amen. It will surely come. Amen. And then he says, verse 38, the, the old popular, for the just shall live by faith. In other words, what is he saying? He's saying God is saying you need to live by what God told you. You need to live from that position where you heard what God said and now you can do it. Do you realize that anybody can do this? You don't have to be special. You don't have to be black or white. You don't have to be male or female. You don't have to have shorts or a dress or a robe or anything. This work for anybody? There, there is a, just a little minute problem. I'll close with this. It's a real small problem. And that problem can be called this. It can be called a gulf. It can be called a division. It can be called a pit. It can be called a separation. And I don't care what you call it. It's just a real small space. It's a small space between you and God. And that small space, now listen to me, religion wants to tell you that it's sin. Don't they? You know what they told you? Well, you know, it, how, how could they get saved to start with then? If sin separates them from God, how in the world are they going to get next to God? That's so dumb. They want to tell you that it's sin. Then somebody say, no, nah, it's my problem. I got this problem. Me and a wacky hall. I got this problem. Me and women. Come on. I, I, I had this one. I got this problem. Me and pocketbooks. I'm addicted to pocketbooks. I got 400 pocketbooks. I have a whole room in my house devoted to pocketbooks. How's that other lady? <laughs> shoes, shoes. Now listen, I said this, and I say it again. The real answer is to get saved. Not what religion taught you. But the real answer is to get saved. And you know what saved means? It means to bridge the gap, to unite the division. It means to cross the pit. It means to break that that's between. That's the real answer. Sozo. Be whole with your source. And I want to tell you something. The gap, the division, the pit, anything you want to call it, is a simple problem that you can solve just by learning to be quiet. The gap is closed in silence. Silence. You ever notice how noisy it is? How noisy the world? You ever notice how people? Oh, it's too too quiet in here. Well, how are you gonna hear what God's saying if you don't get quiet? Silence. Be still and know. That's how you get saved. You just, oh, yeah. Oh, you just drink it in and see what God's saying. Hallelujah. Now, let me say, I share this, I close. And this happens a lot. When, I, when I'm doing whatever this is that I'm doing, I don't know what you call this. Some call it preaching to you. I don't know what you I have people many times, especially if they are gifted in the gift in the gift of music, writes songs out of the things that I say. I have one fella, he'd been working on a song, and he got a CD, he got a tape in the mail, 
And he said, man, he said, there's several things you said, that song just come together. And I completely agree with this brother right now. I'm trying to learn how to sing this message. That's why I said, stop in the night. But, but it ain't worth it because I would like to wrap this up in hot dogs so you chew it. <laughs> you know? Or a piece of chocolate cake. Because it's just too good not to eat. Oh, it's just so good. I tell you, God is transforming us. Yeah. Hallelujah. God is just doing awesome, awesome things. Now, 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 you know, for me, it's just more exciting each moment as it goes by. Amen.